Cherubs, this is Leia Kawan and his sons. If you've ever visited the Vatican Museum, you probably saw this life-size sculpture of suffering, and you were probably awed by it. It's a strange mix of horrifying and beautiful. Three humans are being attacked by two snakes, and it's not going particularly well for the humans. But their struggle is somehow artful. The body of Leia Koan seems to form a serpentine S twisted in agony, and his sons are in different stages of helplessness. It's a showstopper, and in the 16th century, when this was first uncovered in Rome, it was a celebrity, if sculptures can be called celebrities. I understand it's not so popular these days, but I'm going to make a video about it anyway, because that's what I do. Search engine optimization be damned. I'm going to make a video about something nobody's ever heard about. It tells the story of a Trojan priest of Apollo who believed the Trojan horse was a trick. He was right. He tried to warn the Trojans not to accept the horse inside the walls. Athena, who was afraid people would actually listen to him, had two snakes come up from the water and murder him. The Trojans believed that his death was a sign that the Trojan horse was actually a gift from the gods, who then punished Laocoon for scorning the gift. Troy accepts the gift, the Achaeans sack the city, and the legendary Trojan Aeneas escapes the burning city, flees to Italy, and founds the city of Rome. The Trojans misinterpreted that situation, and it had consequences. Misinterpretations are going to be a theme here, so look out for them. So trying to date this sculpture is famously difficult. Most critics agree that it's a marble copy of an original bronze statue completed by sculptors from Rhodes and commissioned by the city of Pergamum. So it's worth talking about the city of Pergamum. Oh, by the way, I'm lucky enough to live a couple hours from Pergamum, so I just went there and got this footage. How cool is that? Pergamum was an ancient Greek city that kind of happened by accident. It was in the right place at the right time. Alexander the Great accumulated quite a bit of gold and silver during his years of conquest. After his death, his generals fought over it. A successor of Alexander, Lysimachus, took possession of the fortune and moved much of it to Thrace, but a significant portion was sent to Pergamum to be managed by an administrator there. Pergamum made sense to hold this wealth because it's pretty much a natural fortress. I mean, look at this. You can see danger coming from pretty far away. Lysimachus died while his fortune was intact, and so did his successors. So Pergamum had all this gold and silver and no one to claim it. So it became an independently wealthy city. The city used that wealth to build an artistic style, and it used Athens as its model, which can best be seen in the massive temple to Zeus that can now be found in... Berlin. Eventually, the rulers in Pergamum knew that they would be the target of Roman conquest, so the rulers of Pergamum drafted a will, leaving the city and all its possessions to Rome. So this sculpture, or perhaps more accurately the original bronze version, which is lost to time, has been called the Swan Song of Pergamum, the city's final artistic expression. Knowing it would lose its autonomy eventually, the city tried to bequeath its heritage to the Romans. This statue could represent that sentiment. The statue, reasonably thought to be commissioned by those final rulers of an autonomous Pergamum, seems to warn against another episode like the fall of Troy, which makes sense. Rome was founded by Aeneas, a Trojan who fled the burning city of Troy to start a new civilization in Italy. So knowing that their artistic heritage would be inherited by the Romans, they commissioned a statue as a warning about how great civilizations fall. The Romans, though, seem to have interpreted it differently. They liked it so much they recreated it in marble because the Romans interpreted the story not as a warning, but as a necessary sacrifice of Laocoon so that Aeneas could escape Troy and found Rome. For them, the statue is about the sacrifices needed to form a great city, so we have good reason to think that the original message of the sculpture was misinterpreted throughout time, which is kind of neat because the sculpture itself represents a misinterpretation of symbols. And this all gets me thinking about that John Green quote about how books belong to their readers and the act of interpretation and hermeneutics generally. The Romans interpreted it in a way that they wanted to, through a lens of self-appreciation and arrogance instead of a warning that great cities are temporary. Today, the sculpture exists within the context of the Vatican Museum and is interpreted by loads of tourists within that space and that time. All interpretation happens through the lens of context and personal relevance, and I find this idea really interesting. Working at a school, I get to see the different ways that different disciplines build knowledge, and our default setting is usually to believe that some definitive knowledge exists and that we're just slowly uncovering it. Knowledge is out there, we just need to find it. Like the mathematician Paul Erdos used to claim that there was a divine book of all the mathematical truths, 
And it was the job of the mathematician to learn those truths, to steal them from the book. It's a belief that knowledge exists distinct from us and that we just need to improve our tools and keep mining away. So the implication is, for example, if Leibniz never existed, calculus would have been discovered anyway by Newton, or somebody else if Newton didn't exist either. If, for some reason, in some huge freak accident, all the work that humanity has ever done on genetics is burned up in some large global fire, it would set knowledge back a few years, sure, but eventually we'd be able to piece back together that information. In the arts, though, knowledge isn't something concrete that exists outside of our own experience and requiring discovery. In the arts, knowledge is found in and through our relationship with the world. When the last painting by the Greek artist Apelles was burned or faded away out of existence, that was it. That work of art will never be discovered again. That insight, that knowledge, it's gone forever. Not many people who stop to look at the sculpture in the Vatican Museum know the story behind it. In fact, art historians are still trying to figure out its origins but they still stop to appreciate it and bring with them a multitude of individual impressions and interpretations. They deal with this sculpture on their own terms and apply its lessons to their own context. So is that okay? I mean, how much do we owe it to the original sculptors and patrons to understand the original intended meaning? Should we just let ourselves fall in love with the different meanings people and cultures throughout history have projected onto it? Does this sculpture belong to its viewers now? Is this a false dichotomy and we need to consider both the original intention and the context we bring to it? I don't know. If any of you have this figured out, let me know in the comments below. And if you like this video and want to see more like it, feel like I've earned your subscription, please consider subscribing. I put out a new video about the 15th of every month. Thank you for watching.